the throne to the Lamb of God we sing blessing honor and power glory forever you reign you reign you reign come on lift your voices just lift up adoration holy 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 are you God
Someone lift up a shout of praise in this house. We adore you. We adore you, Jesus. There's nobody like
Welcome to church and you can take your seats. Hey church, welcome to Easter at Anchor. We're so excited and thankful that you've chosen to worship with us as we honor Jesus and His resurrection. It's going to be an incredible experience and a time of worship and fellowship. For those visiting with us today, we wanted to let you know about our normal Sunday experience. And we invite you to join us again next week for the opportunity to further connect with our community. Anchor Church loves the next generation. At Anchor Kids, we offer an enriching environment rooted in faith for children from infancy through fifth grade. Our mission is to help your children navigate their relationship with the Lord while also offering worship, personalized curriculum, and meaningful connections. Anchor Students is the student ministry of Anchor Church, available for 6th through 12th grade. Our Wednesday night gatherings are a great way to build community, grow in your identity in Christ, and create lasting and authentic connections. So come join us on Wednesdays for a powerful and engaging experience. Anchor students are also heading back to Lake Levon for summer camp from July 22nd through the 26th. If you're ready to experience the best week of your summer, register online now by visiting myanchorchurch.com slash camp. Anchor Women offers a welcoming atmosphere for the women of Anchor to connect, uplift one another, and experience personal and spiritual growth together. From fostering deep friendships to delving into matters of faith and daily life, Anchor Women is for women from all walks of life. Our Cultivate Weekend, happening October 25th and 26th, is open for registration now at myanchorchurch.com slash events. Likewise, Anchor Men provides a space for the men of Anchor Church to connect, learn, and grow together. Through mentorship, brotherhood, and shared experiences, our men's ministry aims to empower men to thrive in every aspect of their lives. Join us May 24th and 25th for Legacy Weekend, our first men's conference. Registration is now open at myanchorchurch.com slash events. If you're ready to take your next step at Anchor, we have a few ways you can do so. Whether you're new to our community or have been a part of it for some time, there are several ways you can deepen your connection and involvement. If you'd like to find out more information, be sure to visit our info desk after service. We are here to help you take your next step no matter where you are on your journey. Here at Anchor, we're a church that gives generously. Your gift makes so much possible and we've made it so easy. Just text any dollar amount to 84321 
or visit myanchorchurch.com slash give for more information. Today, we're in store for an incredible word. So go ahead and get out your Bibles and a way to take some notes, and let's prepare for today's message. I wonder if you know him. Don't try to mislead me. Do you know my king? The Bible says he's a king of the Jews. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he is the Lord of lords. Now that's my king. Well, no barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. No means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoulder supply. Well, he's enduringly strong. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's impurely powerful. And he's impartially merciful. That's my king. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's preeminent. Well, he's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good. He's the only one able to supply all of our needs simultaneously. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. Do you know him? Do you know my king? Well, my king is a king of knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a gateway of glory. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Do you know him? Well, he's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. I'm coming to tell you, the heavens of heaven cannot contain him, let alone a man explaining him. You can't get him out of your mouth. You can't outlive him. And you can't live without him. Well, Pharisees couldn't stand him. But they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimony to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. He always has been. And he always Come on, kill him. Shout of praise. Come on, praise him. God, we love you. Man. Oh, it like he goes on about three or four more minutes. Man, how, how many of y'all know heaven is gonna be awesome? Can I get an amen? Happy Resurrection Sunday, Easter, whatever you want to call it. Today is a, I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly what day he raised from the dead, but this is a great one to celebrate. Can I get an amen? Man, it's so good to be with you guys today. Let's just praise him. Father, we love you. We welcome you here. I'm so thankful for your plan. And we just, we just love being in your presence. We love worshiping you and hearing your word. We give you all glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, praise him. He's so good. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to the book of Acts chapter 1 and Zechariah chapter 14. Uh, um, Acts chapter 1 and uh, Zechariah 14. Zechariah is right, right towards the end of the Old Testament, kind of right in the middle of the Bible. Not the middle exactly, but right before uh, the New Testament. And we, we've been in a series um, at Anchor called Encounter. 
And um, the reason, like we, I called it, we, our team called it Encounter. They came up with the topic, but I, I wrote like the entire year of the sermons that I'm going to be preaching the entire year back in like October of last year. And I knew that I was going to be taken from the month of uh, February and March and April and May a journey through the 12 major mountains in the Bible. And for lots of reasons, it's like there's a real significant reason when God calls people up to high places. And so we've taken a look at the Mount of Temptation and several of the mountains. And today we're actually going to what's called the Mount of Olives and the Mount, Mount Zion. And Mount Zion wasn't always Mount Zion until David actually conquered Jerusalem, the Jebusites the Je- in, there in Jerusalem. He conquered that territory and it became Jerusalem, Mount Zion, the holy city of God. And, and that's a significant place. Like everything happening right now in the world in a negative sense, especially all warfare, is not about oil. It's about that little strip of land called Israel. That's, that's what it is. And um, there's, there's a, I'm going to be unpacking the next few weeks, the Mount of Beatitudes, then we're going, you know, backwards. We're going to Mount Zion, then we're going to, I mean, Mount um, uh, uh, Carmel, and um, then we're going to uh, the, the uh, my, my mind's going blank. I'm looking at all you people thinking, I'm so glad you're here. And I'm like naming mountains, Louisiana, Mount Louisiana, <laughs> Mount LSU, you know. Mount Sinai is what I was trying to say. And, um, and, and so if you, there's comparison, but what you're going to really realize is that out of all the mountains in the world, this is the one everybody's fighting over. This is the reason they're fighting over is because there's a, a false religion in the world today called Islam. It's a false religion. And it's based around a prophet Muhammad, uh, there's a false prophet Muhammad, several years after Jesus was crucified, buried, and raised from the dead, gets a revelation that Abraham didn't sacrifice or bring his son Isaac up Mount Moriah, he brought his son Ishmael. And literally on that spot where you see that, that dome there, on the Temple Mount, they fought and, and claimed that that is the place where Abraham brought Ishmael, but it's not. It's the holy. It's the place where Abraham brought Isaac. And long story short, what you see around here, all of these boxes. Anybody know what those are? It's the largest Jewish graveyard in the world. 150,000 Jews are buried right there. And I want to let you know that the reason they're buried there is because there's one prophecy I'm going to show you in Zechariah that tells you that when the Messiah comes, he's going to set foot right there on the Mount of Olives. It's going to split in two. I mean, it is a hot spot, but it's not just a hot spot in the future. It's a hot spot right now. It was Jesus' quiet place when he came to Jerusalem. He prayed there. At the base of the mountain is the Garden of Gethsemane, and that's where his sweat became his drops of blood under the anxiety and pressure of going to the cross. In Acts chapter 1, the Bible tells us that Jesus had already risen from the dead. He'd already appeared to all of his disciples and over 500 other eyewitnesses. And then he appeared on the Mount of Olives with his disciples, and he gave them kind of a final commission. And then the Bible says in Acts Acts chapter 1, verse 9, that after he said this, after he said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, after he said that you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, after he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you've seen him go into heaven. Well, they think, they, they think something crazy is going to happen right there on the mountain. They're like, when the Holy Spirit comes, are you going to kick tail and take names? Is that when you're going to topple Rome? Like, is that when you're going to start the revolution? Is that when you're going to overturn everything? And he said, times and dates are not for me to share with you right now. He didn't say it isn't going to happen. What, he, what he's saying is that the tail kicking time is coming. I'm going to reign in heaven right now. And what you actually see from Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1 through 4, is, is one of many things I'm going to be unpacking over the next several weeks. But the Bible says a day of the Lord is coming. Come on, everybody just say that out loud. A day of the Lord is coming regardless of what you think is happening in the world and what's going to happen in these times and what's going to happen in 2024, what's going to happen with Russia and China and Persia, and all, which is Iran and Turkey and all these nations and all the warfare and the chaos in the world, regardless, I'm letting you know, right there on Mount, the Mount of Olives, 
the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Messiah, is going to set his feet. And the Bible says in Zechariah 14, verse not, verse. Uh, four. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from the east to the west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. Now you're like, why in the world are you telling me that? Because I can guarantee you the 11 disciples, when they saw Jesus on the cross, they didn't remember this verse. It was what I call a wet concrete moment. A wet concrete moment. Everybody say wet concrete moment. <clears throat> a wet concrete moment is when things are unsettled, not quite settled. And I just want to let you know that whatever you write in that concrete, in a wet concrete moment, stays for a long time. And wet concrete moments is where your soul is shocked. It's where your entire body, all the fibers of your being, your mental intellect, your memories, your emotions, your feelings, all of them come to the surface and you are, you're white hot. What people say to you in that moment, you take very personally. Anybody ever said the wrong thing to you at a grave or a funeral or a bad time? Like you picked the wrong day to say that, brother. They're not your friend anymore, are they? No, but what also happens is trauma has hit the heart of many children. And all of you were children at one time and maybe some of you are right now. But when trauma hits the heart of a child, what actually happens is when trouble or surprise suddenly hits your soul, that moment is like wet concrete. And it's like wet concrete because whatever you do and whatever you declare in these moments has power to set permanence in your heart and in your legacy. And this morning, I want to share a message with you called Wet Concrete Moments. If you're taking notes, write this down. You're gonna, it's a powerful message, and it's from the Lord. I'm going to be speaking, but there's like a thousand messages going to be going off in your hearts. And so let's just welcome him here. Father, today in Jesus' name, we welcome you. <laughs> Lord, I, we have the privilege of having your word from beginning to end. And there's just something inside of me that longs for your return. I long for you to come even now. That you come in justice. I just want to see you. I want to see you win in the earth like you've won in my heart. And Lord, I thank you for establishing your church. And I know that you're moving in each precious person that's here today. And they came to hear from you, not a man with white jeans on. So Lord, I ask you to speak in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. High five your neighbor and say, I left my white jeans at home. I left my white jeans at home. High five your other neighbor and say, man, you look like a little, you lost a little bit of weight since I saw you last. Just go ahead and tell them that. It's okay to lie on Easter. Well, how many of y'all remember love notes as a kid? Like, how many of you like remember, all you guys that grown up with like phones, you don't even know how to write, you know what I'm saying? You're like, I don't know what a love note is. What is that? Well, like people with game like me used to pass these around at school, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, I even remember how to fold a oh man. Like I know how, look at that. I know how to fold a, a note. I fold that thing, bam, and bam, and then bam, and then bam, and then I tuck it in that little pot and say, Will you be mine, Valentine? <laughs> Some of y'all are like, man, that's a great idea. <laughs> and I wrote on the outside of this a wet concrete moment. And like, I, I remember like lots of different moments where messages hit your heart. And some people describe these as strongholds today because like in your moments of pain, messages come into your heart. And what you believe, what you declare, and what you say in your early moments of pain really set inside your being what you believe about yourself and what you believe about the future. So not everybody at the cross is thinking Zechariah 14, one through four, he's gonna come set feet on the mountain. Not everybody's thinking that his bones are not, body's not gonna see decay. He's gonna be raised. And they're, they're not putting it together until after the resurrection. It's a wet concrete moment and there's chaos everywhere when Jesus dies and when he's buried. It's a wet concrete moment. One of my first ones was, was because I, I had a little crush on Casey Hart, y'all. Okay, that's not my wife. My wife's name is Sarah, right? But I thought Casey, like, I was like, Casey, she's, she was a pretty girl in the third grade. The problem is I look like this. This is me in the third grade right there. <laughs> I mean, for real, I had a big old afro and I prayed to God that he would take my curls away and he answers my prayers because I'm holy. <laughs> For real, man. I'm like, I, that, that's me. I mean, ain't nobody saying yes to that dude. Hey, I love you. But here's my game. Like, my game was if she sees me putt a football on the playground, she's going to want to marry me. So I'd be like putting as high as I could. I was throwing as far as I could. You get the right girl in a room with a bunch of guys, they'll all break their ankle trying to impress her. 
And I, I remember, I remember it, the, she gave me a note on the bus one day. And she lived on a different neighborhood. We dropped her off at, you know, she'd get on the bus and she wrote right past me, man. She, she, wrote, me a let, she wrote me a note. But it's not, it didn't say what y'all think it said. It said this. <laughs> I don't want to be your girlfriend. I just want to be friends. <laughs> and like, do, you, do you remember the first time somebody made you feel you didn't have what it takes? Do you remember? I remember taking that note home and reading it, just making sure the words were right. You know, like, like uh, uh. whatever you write in your heart in those wet concrete moments sticks for a long time. Here's another one, a wet concrete moment. Your services are no longer needed here. Thank you for all you've done. We wish you the best. We feel like God is leading you to another job. In church, they go, we really feel like the Lord has put an end to your season here. How many of y'all, if somebody's ever told you that your season's up in their employment? It's a wet concrete moment. What you write in your heart about what just happened and what's happening there, it has a lot to do with what you actually believe the context of the whole story is. And I'm telling you this right here. No matter what comes against you, because of this day, because Jesus has risen from the dead, hope is always alive and well. It's always alive. There's no message that can hit your heart that can override the perfect resurrection of Jesus Christ. But here's a few that affect a lot of people. Um, I no longer want to be married to you. I'm separating, filing for divorce. Ever got a note like that? It's a wet, concrete moment. Th this one's really strong, especially for all of you who are children of divorce or all of you who are children right now that have seen your parents fighting or going through something. It's really weird how kids will act. Kids will literally become different people to try to perform to keep mom and dad together when they feel like mom and dad are going away because in their hearts, they never heard these words, but in their hearts, they're afraid of ever hearing these words. Your mom and I are going to always be your parents. And you know, there's a big old butt coming up right after that. But we're no longer going to be married. We're not going to be married anymore. And that conversation for a lot of kids, man, they, they go into all kinds of tantrum experiences. And for the next few years, they're mad, they're angry, they resent. And it's, it's a wet concrete moment. It's not like it's irreversible. But what actually happens in those moments, what you write, what you allow the enemy to write in the wet concrete of your soul and you repeat and how you act literally causes entire impact to happen throughout your entire legacy and if you actually have some things that are written in the concrete of your heart right now because of traumatic moments, I'm letting you know, Resurrection Sunday is a great time to let God put some fresh concrete in there, get new writing going on. Here's a few more. You have a torn ligament and you have to have surgery. Several people hear that and they've got their future, their hope is in the sport and all of a sudden the sport is gone. It's a wet concrete moment. They start to imagine and they're like, shock, shock just hits their soul and they're like, I can't, I can't even hear you. I can't even process that. Another one is you have a very aggressive form of cancer, and we need to start treatment immediately. We've actually had people here at Anchor. One was here on Friday night. Another one's here right now. Another one was here, you know, four, four different people that I know of in the past year and a half that had aggressive forms of cancer and have been healed, completely healed. But in the moment, I've seen, praise God, yeah. But in the very moment, it's like you, you literally are in a moment where that shock hits your soul. And that word cancer, just like, it's like, it's immediately the cause of wet concrete. It causes your whole body to what? To fear death. How many of y'all are afraid of heights? Raise your hand. No, no, no. You're not afraid of heights. You're afraid of falling to the ground and splatting and dying, right? Now, how, that was a trick question. Let me ask you a real one. How many of y'all are afraid of spiders? Anybody afraid of spiders? No, you're afraid of getting bitten and swelling up like a toad and dying, all right, one, 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 one more. Anybody, anybody afraid of snakes? No, you're not afraid of snakes. You're afraid of getting bitten and dying. There's a fear of death that hits all of our soul. Death has a sting to it, has a pain to it. And boy, when death in any way, the loss hits our soul, it's a traumatic moment. Here's the last one, and it's, it is what it is, but your son, your daughter is being deployed and will be gone for the next two years. For some of you, that's not deployed. That just is, they're, they're going away, they're moving away, or they've got a job in another state, or whatever it is. It hits your soul and it lets you know things are not going to be the same. And they left that picture up there again the whole time. I want you to put something up there a little bit less epic. <laughs> so let me share with you three, life, three of life's most powerful concrete moments. And I'll tell you what they are in advance. One 
is, the first one is, it's when hope seems lost. Everybody say the word seems. Because in Christ, hope's never lost. I sign every email, every letter I write, almost every post I make on social media, I write at the bottom of it, hope, uh, best ahead. That's what I write, best ahead. It's not just a tagline. I, I literally remember the dark moments of my life where I had no hope. I, I felt I didn't feel any hope. I didn't feel like Jesus was real. I didn't feel like I could trust the Bible. And I literally was having a dark moment. And I was pastoring a church in my very first year. Go, go, go tell your church you want to preach, but you don't really know if Jesus is really alive. That was a very hard time in my life. And I've been there. I've been at a time where I feel like hope is lost. And I'll tell you how I got through that in point number three today. But this was a very dark time. I've been through that. I've been where a lot of you are. But when I say hope seems lost, this is what I mean. I want you to understand this, that even when hope seems lost, it's not lost. It's never lost. Hope is never lost. Why? Because Jesus conquered the grave. There's nothing on this earth you can possibly be afraid of he hasn't conquered. If he conquered the grave and promises you he's coming, root your entire soul in that promise. Root, don't, don't allow wars and rumors of wars and what's gonna happen to Israel. I heard somebody say the other day, like if Israel actually loses their state, the Bible's not true. I'm like, no, don't, don't write off anything no matter what happens. Don't write off anything. Hope is always alive and well. So here's what I mean by that. It's not lost. And so you've gotta remember the promises and the character of God. Pursue him until you're able to worship. Now, I don't know how many of you have actually had a traumatic experience where you've gone through something that let you know that hope has seems to be lost. For us, in 2010, um, my wife and I were in the process of planting a church, and it never got off the ground. Because in November, we found blood in our 15-month-old Cassidy's diaper. And Sarah, at this time, was nine months pregnant with our fifth. And so we, we're, we're in a situation like, oh, that's weird. Some blood in her diaper? What happened? And there's blood in the diaper again. And so we're like, take her to the doctor. And we find out that she actually has what's called E. coli. And we didn't know what that meant. We just know it's like, okay. So we start studying the kidneys and husks and all this, these different things that we know a lot about now. But in that time, this was 13 years ago, we didn't know what it was. And so we take her to Children's Hospital like they tell us to. And they start to do what's called dialysis on her, which means their, their, their kidneys weren't working and they start to drain all the fluid out of her body. And the form of dialysis they had her on wasn't working. This is a picture of her. And at 15 months old, this port that they put, she still has a scar on her stomach right here along the, the, the bottom right there. But she also had stuff going in her arms and her whole precious body was just under great stress. We had to put a sign above her bed, do not turn baby over, because a really smart nurse in the middle of the night came and made the concrete really wet, <laughs> turned her body over on her stomach, and literally the toxins were just leaking throughout her entire cavity. Her lungs filled up with fluid and it almost killed her. And it was a really hard time. And so I spent, it was about four weeks, I spent over 20, 26, 27 nights in ICU. It's a wet concrete moment. And there's lots of prayer, lots of things are going on, but you have to understand Sarah was due with Madeline, our 13-year-old now. She was due with Madeline on December 28th, all right? She, Sarah didn't go into labor. December 28th, 29th, 30th, and 31st. On December 31st, New Year's Eve of 2010, the nurses came into the room and they told me, Sarah wasn't there, and they told me, Cassidy's blood pressure has been averaging 155 to 160 over 120 to 130. If you don't know what that is, that is deadly high. And they said, we've done all we can. We've got to, she needs a miracle like soon or we're, we're going to have to like, and they just basically said, we don't know. We don't know because we've never done a kidney transplant on a baby this small. And so it's a for sure a wet concrete moment. And I closed the door. I pulled the curtain in the ICU room. I said, I put, I said, put a note on the door. Don't nobody come in here. I was mad. I was, uh, my faith was not strong. I was shocked. I was very frustrated. And I just, I got out a flask of oil, frankincense and some other oil, some, not like essential oils. Come on, they didn't have all that back then. But I got some, a flask of oil and I remember praying for her 
and anointed her belly with oil and just let, knelt down beside her bed. For the, the first 20 minutes, I am mad. It's, it's, it's taken me back to the time of when I was early in ministry mad. It took me back to the very first four-year-old funeral that I preached, the star knuckles, that she had gotten cancer and she died. And I carried her precious little body out of the house with her dad and her Dora nightgown. And I, I went and threw away all the Dora nightgowns. You know, I was like, like I, I can't, I, I, I'm mad. I, I stood there in front of a thousand people in Sulphur Springs, Texas and played I'll Fly Away on her pink Barbie guitar. And I felt all of that anger in this moment when I thought, my daughter. And I began to, to cry and I began to pray. What's happening in this moment, man, is like I'm looking at a lot of you guys, and some of you didn't have as big of a win as I had. But over the next 20 minutes, I'm praying, I'm crying, I'm worshiping, and then about the next 45 minutes, like literally, I am just worshiping. It's like the Lord just revealed to me, this is going to happen, this is going to make it. I just sensed his presence so strongly. I looked up over my shoulder and looked back at the blood pressure monitor, and it said 120 over 70. In that hour, God completely healed her. By the seven o'clock the next morning, she was in her own room and Sarah went into labor and Madeline was born. Come on, praise God. That's exactly what, that's what happened. And I'm not telling you that this all happened. You're gonna be like, well, where's that oil? I'll sell it to you for 150 bucks. No, I'm not that kind of slick dude. Like, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to memorialize what happened in her healing. I'm just trying to tell you that you live as if hope is alive and well. We all have our Isaac moments where we let go of what matters most to us in exchange for what matters most to us. We all have to go through those times. And this is a beautiful picture, you know, but I couldn't see that. I couldn't see Madeline in a cute face and Cassidy counting her fingers one day. I couldn't see her at 14 baptizing her. But what I'm letting you know is when it seems that hope is lost, be careful what you write in the concrete of your heart. Be careful. For Mary Magdalene, it was very different. For Mary Magdalene, man, she's following Jesus with all of her heart. Why? Because Jesus cast, come on, seven demons out of her. It would have been about 400 if it was me. <laughs> he freed her. He didn't objectify her body like other men did. He saw her soul. He spoke to her. He saw her eyes. He was, he was moved with compassion for her. Just like he was everybody else. And she's, she just lived her life as if I've never seen love like this. I've never felt love like this. I've never experienced hope like this. But when he was arrested, she saw him as a witness taking care of his needs, dragged and carrying that wooden beam down the Via Della Rosa and walking those streets of Jerusalem all the way to the cross. She saw him bloodied and marred, disfigured, his face from whom men hide their faces, saw him flogged, beaten, persecuted at the point of death. Nothing inside of her sees Zechariah 14, verse 1 through 4. He's going to step foot on the mountain, not in the wet concrete moment. But something inside her says, even if all the other disciples leave, I'm following him. I'm staying at the cross. And she stayed there until his body was broken down and taken from the cross the Bible says that she's witnessed Jesus. He gave up his spirit with a loud cry, a loud sigh. And as he breathed his last, at that moment, she actually experienced and saw the curtain of the temple torn in two. She felt the earth shake. When Jesus died, the whole earth shook. When he died, the entire religious system was torn from top to bottom in two. Also, when he died, the patriarchs of old were resurrected and started walking the streets of Jerusalem. We just sang about that. They're like, hey, what the McDonald's there last time I was here? This is awesome. No, no, no. <laughs> they walk in the streets. And then the Bible says this, the earth shook. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene. The Bible tells us that she actually went with Joseph of Arimathea and a man named Nicodemus. Joseph of Arimathea was a believer, a follower in Jesus, a very wealthy man. And he had a tomb, and he had persuasion. He went to the governing leader and actually asked for permission to bury Jesus' body in his tomb. He also embalmed Jesus' body with 75 pounds of spices. 
Come on, somebody. That is a blood-soaked linen tunic. That, blood, that linen garment they wrapped him up with is like sticking to his flesh. It's not like a pretty little nice little bed sheet like you have. It is a really gross, bloody moment. And now how many of y'all wore some Jerkar Noir whenever you were back in middle school? How many of y'all know a seventh grader can put on a lot of cologne and still stink? <laughs> You're like, oh, you come to my house. Yeah, for real. Now, I'm not talking about a couple of squares of Dracar Noir. That's a cologne if you weren't like old enough to remember that. Some of y'all are like, I still wear it, man. Why are you making fun of me? <laughs> All right. No, cool. Maybe one day you'll upgrade to Stetson. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right. I'm messing with y'all's cologne now. Imagine, imagine spilling a bottle of, of, of cologne. Now imagine spilling 75 pounds of cologne. You ever picked up a 75-pound dumbbell? Break that on the ground. Fragrance is all over that tomb. And for whatever reason, the Bible says that Mary stayed there and watched him. Then she went home because it was Sabbath and she rested. And at the crack of dawn, the very moment that she can get up and go be with Jesus or find him, she cannot wait to keep on going. Because something inside her is like hope seems lost. But you don't keep on following a dead Messiah unless you think, got to be something else going on here. So she goes to the tomb. The Bible says that she, she actually went to the tomb while it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. You know, why is she running? Because, I mean, imagine this. The biggest wet concrete moment of your life. Like your mom dies all of a sudden. And then, you, then at the morgue, you go to do the arrangements the next day. And they're like, we lost your mama's body. Well, you're about to lose your throat, brother. Like, you lose mama. You can't lose mama. How'd you lose my mama? How'd you lose her? Well, I don't know where she is, man. We brought her here. We told her. We said, whatever. whatever. It's like, dude, you, you're dead to me. And so what she's thinking is, how in the world? Like, they, 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 somebody took his body out of the tomb, and I don't know where they put him. Peter, this is a bad deal. Well, Peter, something in Peter is like, oh, oh, every man's like, let's go fix the situation. How many of y'all would like sprint to the tomb to fix the empty tomb? Like, oh, oh, oh I'll go find him myself. Peter and John raced to the tomb. The Bible says that they, they ran to the tomb. And you know the Bible's real because John wrote the book of John and he calls himself the one Jesus loved. <laughs> the one Jesus. And he actually says he outran Peter to the tomb. I mean, like, if I wrote it, I'd go ahead and let them know I'm faster than Peter and love more, too. <laughs> it's really fascinating that she told them that, and go to the next verse. It says that after Peter and John are gone, they leave because they're like, I'm going to go find who took his body. I ain't staying here. What are you doing? Let's stay here and worship. I ain't stay, let's stay here. He's going to come back. I ain't staying here. Somebody took him. They're like, it's sword time. It's kick tail, take name time. Like you, you killed him and now you took his body. Peter and John are gone. They're like, what in the world's going on? Not Mary. The Bible says that she stood outside the tomb crying. And then it says, as she wept, she bent over to look in the tomb and she saw two angels in white. Whoa, 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 whoa. If you've ever read the book of Exodus, what happens is the more you know of the Lord, the stronger you are in your hope. How many of you have ever heard of the tabernacle? Tabernacle? The tabernacle was a place where the Jewish people, the Israelites, worshipped. It's a pattern of heaven. There's an outer court where there's an altar, a brazen altar, where sacrifices were made. There's a laver for washing. Then you go from the outer court into the inner court. And the inner court is where the priest would minister. There's a table of showbread there. There's the menorah of lighting. Then there's the altar of incense. This is a atmosphere of worship. Worship is offered to the Lord there. But then there's the holy of holies. And only the high priest would go into the holy of holies. And what's in the holy of holies? What's there? The Ark of the Covenant is there. The Ark of the... Y'all, I mean, y'all like, ah, the Raiders of the Lost Ark? Rock Ark? Yes, yeah, it's, it's different, but yeah. So the Ark of the Covenant's there. Well, guess what's on top of the Ark of the Covenant? The mercy seat and two angels at the end, at each end. What actually happens is Mary stuck around long enough to see 
the angels, and I don't know when this made sense to her, but she actually saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other one at the foot. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I'm like, man, that's, there's just so many details in Scripture that just make me come alive with, you don't make stuff like this up. And it makes me wonder, this story is not only true, it's the foundation of everything that's true on the entire planet. And I'm running hard after God with all my heart my entire life. I'll preach until I lose my voice, serve until I can't move, and believe. And I just, it moves me. Not Mary. The two angels spoke to her and said, hey, why are you crying? She said, oh, they, they've taken my Lord. She's writing in her concrete. They've taken my Lord away, and I don't, I don't know where they put him. As she said this, at this, she turned around and saw Jesus. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? They took my Lord away. She sees Jesus, but the eyes of her heart are not opened. How many of you have heard messages all your life, but you still don't believe? It's because you're not born again. The eyes of your heart have not been opened to see truth. You need to be born again, even to believe. That's a grace from God. You're like, I think I'm going to believe when I get it. No, you're not going to believe until he opens the eyes of your heart. And he knows when you're ready. He knows. You're like, really? Watch this. She saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. And then he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Well, thinking he was a gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I'll, I'll go get him. Talking to her didn't open her eyes. Let me ask you a question. It's a very personal question. It's a great Easter question. If you could hear the voice of God and he could speak one word to you, what would you want him to say to you? You don't have to answer. I'll tell you what it is. It's your name. You, you want to know he knows you. You want to know he sees you. You want to know he's got you. You want to know he did create you in your mother's womb. Come on, how many of y'all are like, it's not fair. God parted the Red Sea for Moses. I'd like a ripple in my bathtub. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I mean, for real. Like, if I just wake up one day and you'd write, hello, Jeff, in the sky, I would serve you, like, wholeheartedly every day, and I'd never sin again. You know, just give me a sign. And Jesus is like he's talking to her. And then all of a sudden he says, Miriam, Mary. And boom, the eyes of her heart came open, wide open. And she turns around and she says, Rabbi, and she reaches for him to touch him. And he says, do not hold on to me. I've not ascended to the father. Go and tell the disciples I've risen from the dead. And she does, man, the first evangelist. All right, point number one was around Mary. The second two are about Thomas, and they're way faster than the first one, all right? So don't get nervous. I'll let you out for lunch in a second. Here's the second one. It's when hope is disorienting. It's not like it seems lost. It's like you, you everything's blurry. This is shocked so deep to your system. You're like, I don't know if I've ever had a moment like this. Well, life hits you hard. And when life hits you hard, things get disorienting. And how many of y'all are pilots? Anybody pilot in here? How many of y'all like, like pilots? I, I like pilots. I need to make friends with them. Like three of them met me in the lobby correcting my, 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 what I'm fixing to teach y'all. You know, because I'm not claiming to be a pilot. I just like to get where I'm going fast. Come on, somebody. But how many of you would actually claim to know how John F. Kennedy Jr. died in 1999? How did he die? Plane crash. We're still debating his dad. We th and how many of y'all are like, he's not even dead? JFK Jr., all the Q people. I don't know if y'all are here or not. You know. You're like, what's Q? Forget it. Right. John F. Kennedy Jr. was flying, not a 2001, but that's a 2001 Piper Saratoga II. That's what that is in the air right there. He was flying, obviously, not a 2001 because he died in 1999, but he was flying a plane similar to that. The issue with John F. Kennedy Jr. was that he was just learning to be trained in what's called in the instruments, reading instruments. And so reading the instruments is like it's very disorienting when you get vertigo and you feel everything's spiraling this way and it's really going that way. Or you feel like things are upside down and they're right side up. So there's a little instrument. There's a thing in the, in the cabin there with the, with the pilot. They see it's called the attitude indicator. 
And the attitude indicator, like this literally lets you know, and pardon me, I'm going to step into a shadow here for a second, but this lets you know right here is the plane. That's how flight, that's the wings of the plane right there. And that's the horizon. But what happens is when you feel like it's going this way and you don't know how to read the instruments, you actually feel like the plane's going down. And so you overcorrect the other way. And that's what leads into a death spiral. The problem is, is John F. Kennedy Jr. was flying at night where he could not see the horizon and he was flying in a storm and he wasn't trained to read the instruments. I'm letting you know this is your instrument. And when you read Zechariah 14, 9, you're like, he's going to set his feet on the Mount of Olives. Then no matter what happens between now and him setting his feet on the Mount of Olives, you've got to know in your heart, it's not over. Hope is alive and well. But when you feel like it's going all the way down, don't melt with the world. Don't let fear get a hold of your heart. Don't let your mouth come into agreement with the enemy. Don't start speaking death over your marriage and your kids and America. And the, I mean, sometimes America, but <laughs> over all the things in the world. I mean, praise, praise God for like faith in Christ. We got a president calling Easter Gay Pride Day, you know what I'm saying? Or Trans Pride Day. Like, yeah, don't start barking on that. Hope is alive and well. Don't get distracted by the chaos and stupidity of this world. Don't do that. It's like, oh, well, it feels like this is disorienting. Here's what you do when hope feels disorienting. You anchor deep into the unseen. You root deeper. You, you're like, I don't, life does not make sense. I'm going deeper here. What you don't want to do is sinking in isolation, you don't want to get in isolation. Why? Because you, you're not a really good person alone with all your thoughts. How many of y'all have ever had a really, really bad day? You didn't want to see anybody, but they showed up anyway, and your day, your day got better. Why? Because honesty expressed. When you express your exact pain in an honest way, you're not the only one carrying that burden. There was a guy in Scripture named Thomas. We know him as Doubting Thomas. And in John 14, verse 1, it says this. Trust in God. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Here's the issue. Jesus said this on the last night of his life. I'm, I'm, go, I'm going away. What, what does that mean? Well, trust in God. Trust also in me. In my father's house are many rooms, many mansions. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will surely come back and take you to be with, with me where I am. And here's what the Bible says. Jesus says, you know the way to the place where I'm going. I'm like, Ugh. How many of y'all are like Thomas? You're like, bro, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? I can't, I'm tired of looking by faith into your riddles. I need you to tell me specifically, where are you going? There's one time where Philip, one of the disciples said this, just show us the father and that'll be enough. Just part the bathtub, something, like do something, like heal my knee, do a do something. And so Thomas was carrying this doubt even into the death already. So were the other disciples. But when Philip and Thomas, Simon Peter, Nathaniel, all of the disciples get together, Peter says, listen guys, Jesus has been raised from the dead. We need to call a church meeting tonight at six o'clock, everybody. Everybody shows up for church except for Judas. He killed himself. And Thomas. Why? Because he's disoriented. He can't see straight. He, the last place he wants to be is anything that has to do with trusting Jesus. But on this night, Jesus came to church. How many of you would be like, that would be a great Sunday? He busted through the walls. And he said, I'm going to show you all something. Right here. Look. Why did he show him that? Because that is crucifixion. Why did he show him his side? Because that's the sign of where they stabbed him in his side after he was already dead to double kill him and make sure he was dead. And he said, hey, listen, guys, trust me. I've got power over what you're afraid of. Well, they leave church and they're like, Thomas, you skipped church on the wrong day, bro. <laughs> like, like, Seeing Jesus? Raised from the dead is better than him in person. 
You, you can't believe what it's like to see him raised from the dead. He's like, I ain't going to believe it. And Thomas actually says this. We've seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Point number three is this. It's a concrete moment. and Some of you are having it right now. It's when hope is alive and well. It's when something inside of you says there's something to this resurrection thing. There's something to this hope is alive and well. There's something to the author and perfecter of our faith. There's something to this God. And I really believe right now, I, be, I, I, have, I feel belief like coming over my heart. And it's not because I'm a great preacher. I'm loud and I ramble and I tell stories a long time. I could do this all day long. It's what God is speaking to your heart, not what I'm saying. And what he's speaking to your heart is trust me. I see you. It's just so powerful when you read scripture and you see what Jesus actually, how personal he gets with each individual. So I just want to read this to you. When hope is alive and well, this is what you're about to do, some of you. You're going to surrender fully to the most powerful force on earth. You're going to completely surrender your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to, you're going to, this Wednesday night, this past Wednesday night, this room was packed with teenagers. 103 teenagers gave their life to Christ for the very first time in this room. Why? Because hope is alive and well. That's what happened. That's what happened. Friday night, Saturday night, two services last night, lots of people have been surrendering fully to the most powerful force on, force on earth. They're being born again. Their hearts are coming alive to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're becoming new creation. They're expressing for the first time full worship to Jesus. You're like, well, what do I do? Well, take a look at this. I'll close with this. The Bible says a week later, his disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Shalom, y'all. Hey, he's Texan. Jesus is Texan. Shalom. Peace be with you. Shalom. Then he said to the guy who skipped church last week, Thomas, hey, out of all the people in the room, I came today for you. Put your finger right here. See my hands. Why? Because crucifixion isn't going to take you out. You don't have to live in fear of snakes, death, heights, spiders, or whatever your unfavorite food is, germs. You don't have to walk around with a mask over your soul. You don't have to be afraid. P put, your, put your hand into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And then Thomas had his most powerful, he became the greatest missionary to the nation of India after this. He became, this is the most powerful concrete moment. You know what he wrote in his concrete? My Lord and my God. Now look at this picture. I'm going to close. It's all going down right there one day. Every one of those tombs are going to come open, except they're, they're going to be like, whoa, Jesus was Messiah? Yeshua. Yeshua HaMashiach. <laughs> Jesus is Messiah. Yeshua is Messiah. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. His feet are going to set foot on that mountain. It's going to split in two, and every enemy in hell and on earth is going to bow its knee to him. Everybody's going to confess then. I want to know if you're ready to confess right now. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Right time to do the right thing is right this very second. And for some of you, you actually sense the presence of God like you never have. You believe his word. You believe he died for you. You believe he was buried in a tomb for you. And you believe he was raised from the dead. And I just want to ask you right now, are you ready to surrender your heart to him? Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that is a gift. God has given you that belief and he's filled your mouth with that confession and if you're at a place right now where you're ready to make him the Lord of your life, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in just a second. And what that is, it's not like a cantation. You're not going to say a prayer and it's a magic. No, 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 no. What's, what the magic is what he just did in your heart. And if you're at a place where you're like, I know he's God, and I'm not playing around with this thing anymore. I'm surrendering my heart to him. I want to give him my heart. And I want to pray with you and pray for you. And if you're one of those people where you know you're ready to give him your whole heart, on the count of three, I want you to boldly raise your hand high. One, two, three. Raise your hand high. Raise it high. Don't be embarrassed. Raise your hand high. Come on, don't be embarrassed. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. 
What I want you to do is from your heart, just say this, Jesus, come on, say it from your heart, Jesus, you win. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died for me. You were buried in a tomb and raised from the dead. From this day forward, by the power of your spirit, I surrender my heart to you and I follow you. Forgive me of my sin. Lead me in my next steps. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give him a shout of praise. He's so good. Come on, give him a shout. He's so good. Praise God. Amen. What a, what a powerful message today. We want to we wanna say welcome again to those of you who are, are visiting. What we're going to do now as we, as we conclude the services, we're going to invite some pastors and prayer leaders up here to the altar, and we're going to open up the altar now for a time of response. And, and especially if today you prayed that prayer for the first time, we want to know, we want to help you take your next steps, whether or not that's questions regarding water baptism, what discipleship means, how you can get more involved at Anchor. We want to invite you to come forward. The, the, uh, these individuals up here at the altar can answer those questions for you. Also, if today you prayed that prayer for the first time, you can just simply text "Hope is Alive" to nine seven triple zero, and that will initiate a communication process with us. We're not going to pester you or or hound you or anything. It's just going to be a way to let us know and get some information and in, into your hands of how you can take your next step in your journey of faith. But even more. Um, uh, maybe not more important, but in addition to that, if today, maybe today, you want to make the decision to grind some of that concrete that you've written in in the past, or maybe as Pastor Jeff said earlier, you want to re-pour some new concrete in your life and rewrite some of those things that have affected you, that have affected your children or your legacy. Today is the day to do that. Don't miss this opportunity. And this altar is a great place to do it. You can come and, and be encouraged by one of the prayer leaders. You can also just come and, and be at the, at the altar alone and pray um, with your pray yourself. But uh, I really want to encourage you to activate your faith today in taking those next steps. Amen. Well, it's, it's, it's an important Sunday. It's Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday, whatever you like to call it. And so again, we say thank you so much for coming, being a part of Anchor today. We invite you to join our community. Come be a part of Anchor Church. As you saw in the video, there's a lot going on this year, and we would love for you to be a part of it and to be connected. And um, we're really, really thankful that you're here today. Let me say a prayer and we'll dismiss. God, we thank you for your presence, for your peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, I pray that you seal in our hearts the work that you have begun. We thank you for your, for your word that's living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. Father, we, we thank you for the cross, for Jesus, for the empty grave, and the truth that we worship a Savior that is alive and no longer dead. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You're dismissed. Have an incredible week.
sits on the throne to the lamb of god we sing blessing honor and power glory forever you reign you reign you reign come on lift your voices just lift up adoration holy holy 